After waiting for seven long years for his project to be considered, Columbus reached Santa Fe just in time to witness, on January 2, 1492, the victorious parade of the monarchs entering the fallen city of Granada. In the moment's atmosphere of joy and enthusiasm, Columbus's project fitted very well in the monarchs' plan of expanding their kingdom once the Reconquista had been accomplished. This project offered them a way to reach Asia's rich lands and commerce, while avoiding violating the Treaty of Alcasovas by trading and traveling along the western coast of Africa. The capitulations of Santa Fe were signed on April 17, 1492. A capitulation, which actually means section or chapter, was the chief written instrument of royal authority. There was considerable debate over the following years on whether this document represented a contract between Columbus and the Crown, or rather a unilateral letter of concession, and therefore a revocable decision granted by the Crown. The capitulations of Santa Fe consisted of a preamble and five paragraphs. Because all the parties conceived of this as a commercial voyage, they were primarily devoted to specifying what and how much each partner would invest and how the profits would be divided. As one partner, the monarchs authorized the voyage to the Indies and appointed Columbus as their hereditary admiral of the ocean seas and viceroy and governor of any islands or mainland he might gain possession in their names. To some, this is today proof of Columbus's greed and desire for glory. Yet, we should consider that this was a common practice. For instance, the king's cousin, Alfonso Enriquez, had been named Admiral of the Ocean around the Canary Islands, and the real Indies would soon have their Portuguese Viceroy. The monarchs were to receive nine-tenths of the precious goods, specifically pearls, precious stones, gold, silver, and spices brought back from the Indies, while Columbus would receive one-tenth. Also, as their sole partner, Columbus could invest up to one-eighth of the cost of outfitting any future fleets and receive one-eighth of the net profits. Once the deal was made, there was only one more problem. Neither of the parties had the money to invest in the voyage. That brought onto the stage other people who were crucial in developing Columbus's endeavor. The Crown invested two million Moravides, borrowed from Luis de Sant Anhal. Sant Anhal was the grandson of converts from Judaism who had managed his family's wealth to considerable profit. In 1475, he gave King Ferdinand an important loan which allowed him to become a member of the Aragonese royal household and then, in 1481, the king's clerk of staff expenditures. His main collaborators were his son-in-law, Gabriel Sanchez, the royal treasurer, and the Genoese merchant Francesco Pinelli, whose family had been conducting business in Valencia for a few decades, principally as wool exporters to Genoa. In 1490, Sant Anhal and Pinelli were named treasurers of the Santa Hermandad, the confederation of municipalities that collected royal taxes for the Granada campaign. Between 1489 and 1491, Sant Anhal, Pinelli, and Sanchez had lent the monarchs almost 25 million Moravides for the Granada War and 11 million Moravides for the transport of the last Muslim king of Granada and his entourage to North Africa they managed the transportation of expelled Jews, and they brokered the sale of slaves from Malaga and the Canary Islands. According to current scholarship, Columbus invested 500,000 Moravides, which was much more than one-eighth of the expenses. His creditors were two Florentine merchants named Gennato Bayrodi and Amerigo Vespucci. Yes, that Vespucci. Gennato Bayrodi belonged to a well-known family of Florentine silk weavers. He had emigrated very young to Portugal to help his father, who was conducting business in Lisbon. 
From there, he was sent to Seville as an intermediary in the slave trade network that comprised Lisbon, Seville, and Valencia, distributing African slaves all over Europe. As it often happened, being successful as a merchant, he soon became one of the monarch's creditors. He was in Santa Fe at the beginning of 1492 to collect debts and look for new investments. Amerigo Vespucci was the descendant of another old Florentine family. He had been provided with a humanist education by his uncle, Giorgio Antonio Vespucci, a renowned Renaissance scholar. He had been sent by the Pope Lano branch of the Medici family to recruit Bayrodi as their factor in Seville, so he had followed him in Santa Fe. The voyage preparations took place in Palos de la Frontera for the following three months. Although Seville was the major port in Castile, it was not situated on the Atlantic shore, but some 80 kilometers up the river of Guadalquivir and connected to a string of smaller ports on the Atlantic coast. Palos was one of them. The port of Palos boasted a long tradition of navigation in the Atlantic. After the Spanish had renounced their rights over Atlantic African seas in favor of the Portuguese by the Treaty of Alcasovas, the citizens of Palos had seen themselves dispossessed of fishing and commercial areas essential for their subsistence. As a result, at the end of the 1400s, they were still disobeying the agreement between their monarchs and the King of Portugal, foraying every now and then into Guinea. For one of these incursions, the city of Palos had been condemned to serve the crown for two months with two caravels rigged at the city's expense. On April 30, 1492, the monarchs ordered those ships to be placed at the service of Columbus. Moreover, so that there was no doubt about the royal nature of the expedition, Queen Isabel bought half of the city of Palos that included the port for 16 million Moravides which she paid in installments. Merchants, pirates, and fighters in the maritime war with Portugal, the three Pinzon brothers were the most famous navigators of Palos. They were chosen to accompany Columbus on his first voyage. However, it is said that they needed some convincing, which was done again by the good Franciscan friars of La Rabida, the monastery situated just a short distance from the port. Three ships were prepared for the expedition. Two of them, La Nina and La Pinta, were caravels, while the third, La Santa Maria, was a now. La Nina was the smallest one, with a crew of 20, and Columbus's favorite due to its excellent maneuverability at sea. Her captain was Vicente Yanez Pinzon. La Pinta had a crew of 30 and was captained by Martin Alonso Pinzon, who was also instrumental in recruiting the men for the whole fleet. La Santa Maria was the flagship, its captain being Columbus himself, and she was a now. A now was a bigger, although less maneuverable ship, and as such, it had the largest crew of 40 and carried most of the cargo. She was also called La Gallega, the Galician, because it belonged to a navigator from Galicia. Her owner, Juan de la Cosa, joined Columbus on his first voyage as a master and later made one of the most famous maps illustrating the discovery of the New World. Besides the officers and the sailors, the crews of the three ships comprised one royal supervisor, three surgeons, one of them also an apothecary, one scribe and one interpreter, two carpenters, one corker, one painter, one tailor, and one confectioner. The small fleet departed from Palos on August 3, 1492, half an hour before sunrise, and reached the Canary Islands on August 9. The course set by Columbus was neither a random choice nor pure intuition. According to the Treaty of Alcasovas, the Spanish could navigate north of the Canary Islands, above the latitude of 28 degrees north. 
Theoretically, then, nothing prevented Columbus from sailing from Palos directly westward. Instead, he went south until he reached the Canaries, intending to sail in a straight line only beyond that point. This course was carefully designed to meet three conditions. The first was complying with the Treaty of Alcasovas, keeping north of the parallel of 28 degrees. The second was making the best use of the winds and currents of the ocean. Columbus knew from his stay in Madeira and his voyages with the Portuguese that sailing along the parallel of 28 degrees, he would find the northeast trade winds to push him westward. The third condition was to have a technical stopover where the crew could resupply the fleet with fresh provisions, water and firewood, which was essential for cooking food. Equally important, by that point they would have already tested the ships on a sufficiently long stretch of the ocean, so they could make the necessary repairs and adjustments before venturing forward. The stopover in the Canaries took longer than planned, as La Pinta needed caulking and a new rudder, and the latine sails of La Nina were replaced with square ones. Finally, on September 6, the ship set sail toward the unknown. Columbus had estimated that the journey would take 21 days, or a maximum of 28, if the winds were light. On October 7, they had already gone past that and covered 2,400 miles. The crew started to lose hope and threatened to mutiny. Only the determination of Martin Alonso Pinzón was able to calm them down. There was concern that they had already passed Sapangu, modern-day Japan, which they expected to find around those coordinates. Thus, they decided to change course to west-southwest, to follow a flock of birds they had just seen. In the early hours of October 12, the sailor Juan Rodriguez Betmeya, known as Rodrigo de Triana, was the first to see land from the crow's nest of La Pinta. They had reached a tiny island in the Bahamas called Guanahani, which Columbus baptized San Salvador in honor of the Holy Savior who had guided their voyage. At this point, we should pause to try and understand why Columbus was convinced till his hour of death that he had got to Asia. It was because, for him, everything added up and made sense. He had trusted his calculations sufficiently to embark on that first journey with three ships and 90 men. He had estimated they would reach land in 28 days, and they had reached it, indeed, in 34. He assumed that they would cover about 2,400 miles, which they did. So, one of the most amazing things about his voyage was that not only had he found land, but he had found it, exactly, where he expected it to be. At that moment in European history, the existence of another continent was not conceivable, as the rumours about lands to the west fell into the category of legendary islands that no one had convincingly ascertained. In the Bahamas, they landed and encountered locals who are very well built, with very handsome bodies and very good faces, who were also perceived as good servants and of quick intelligence. Columbus was impatient to leave for another very large island, which I believe must be Sapangu according to the signs which these Indians I have with me make. They call it Colba. But Colba turned out to be Cuba. Sure of having reached an archipelago off the eastern coast of Asia and being close to the fabulous riches described by Marco Polo, Columbus sailed along the northern coast of Cuba and found Haiti which he renamed Hispaniola. Unfortunately, on Christmas night 1492, his flagship, Santa Maria, hit a reef and was shipwrecked. Fortunately, they didn't lose any men, but they lost all the cargo. 
left only with La Nina, since Martin Alonso Pinzon had sneaked off on the Pinta to look for gold by himself according to some, or simply got separated from La Nina because of a communication error, according to others, Columbus decided to return to Castile. As there was not enough space on La Nina for all the crew of Santa Maria, they had to leave behind 39 men on the island of Hispaniola. With the aid of the Taina people inhabiting the island, led by a chief called Guaconagari, they built a fort which they named La Navidad, partly using the remains of the destroyed ship. The voyage back was challenging, as although they found the westerlies that drove them home, they were caught in a terrible storm. La Nina was forced to seek harbour in the Azores, where they were received with hostility by the Portuguese authorities, and from there, they limped to Lisbon. Columbus was obliged to report to the Portuguese king, which left him suspected of collaborating with Spain's enemies and cast a shadow on his return to Palos on March 15, 1493. If you want to learn about how the Castilian and the Portuguese crowns divided the world between them, with the Pope's blessing, and about Columbus's second voyage, please join me for the next video.